So, hello? Oh. No, no, no. No, we're not, no, we're not allowed. allowed. Not allowed. Yes. Okay, good. All right. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jakub Paroszynski, um, part of The Fix, amongst others. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, first of all, it's uh, Friday uh, night at 8. I um, uh, actually want to issue a big thanks to the organizers, to Chris, Francesca, and the whole team at the uh, Journalism uh, Festival um, for accommodating a last minute change. It's not easy when you're running an event of this scale, and uh, it's very impressive. Um, please also bear in mind that uh, you know um, we have uh, about 44 days now of uh, sleeping a couple of hours, and it's Friday night, so uh, yeah, we're going to do our best. Um, so, look, a couple of things that I um, uh, that I wanted to share before we we jump into the details. So, uh, the um, uh, the fix, which was, uh, I think it's fair to say, the leading organization in a coalition of organizations, um, was not built for the war. None of us were. Um, I, with some rare exceptions, I think nobody really is. Um, you know, before, uh, before everything happened, uh, our goal was to shed light on what is happening in the media sector. Uh, we had a publication destined towards publishers. We still have a publication that's continuing work, and thank you so much for the team who is continuing to do that. Uh, Teona, you are doing a great job uh, running everything. Um, we did research, we collected data, we worked with publishers to help them solve their problems. And uh, that was the situation, the last presentation that we had from before the war, back down on the, on the fix. I don't know what the current situation is, but I know that, that uh, on February 24, um, the, uh, I'm not gonna have just slides, I need to look at my notes. On February 24, the situation changed and the publishers that we were previously working with, doing analysis on, doing case studies on, um, our goal became to help them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I will pull it back in in a moment. Okay. So, what I want to ah, okay. The no, we don't need the screen. No, 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 okay. we don't. Okay, okay, good. Okay, very good. All right. Okay. Um. So. Uh, look, um, a lot of our team has roots in Ukraine. We have a lot of team members in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, what happened was very personal. Um, this, uh, I really want to thank everybody that was involved. And if I could actually ask the team members, the ones who are wearing the hoodies and also not wearing the hoodies, to stand up for a moment, uh, if you can. So for a lot of us, this is the first time uh, that we get to work together to see each other in real life. Uh, for some of us, we know each other for a long time. Uh, there is a, an effort of about 20, 25 people who have been, thank you. Thank you so much. There are about 20, 25 people who have pulled into this effort from various organizations, despite going through some of the worst moments in their lives. Um, and I want to thank all of you for that. And uh, I'm very sorry for the colleagues who could not come for various reasons, being stuck in Ukraine, being in different places with different obligations. Media matter. And I would say that in Ukraine especially, media play a, a huge role. It is no accident that the current war is a case of two of the most authoritarian anti-press freedom states on the planet, invading one that had the most vibrant independent media scene in the region. In 2013, when there was an attempt to Ukraine into 
onto the path that unfortunately Russia and Belarus have been lost on. Uh, the people of Ukraine revolted and kicked out their dictator, in aspirational dictator, I think you can call, call, call Yanukovych that. Um, and media played a huge role. The first protests on Maidan were called by a journalist. Uh, many media were born on the Maidan and continued to operate out of there. And this representation and the symbol of freedom that Ukraine was is, is I think, precisely why it is um, currently being attempted to be destroyed. And uh, this is also why we cannot let Ukrainian media perish. And this has been our driving idea from the very beginning, is that the media represent a unique legacy in the post-Soviet space. They know how to report, they know how to build sustainable, independent, competent, impactful uh, organizations. And we cannot let the current war, which is devastating Ukraine's infrastructure, its people, is leading to thousands of deaths, to also take away this key part of their culture. Uh, we're going to jump in into a second, but um, I just wanted to share a, a, a couple of key thoughts um, from the because I have the privilege of holding on to the microphone now, which is you know uh, facts on the ground. Um, so what what did we learn? Um, the first thing is that once you know exactly what you need and what to do, it is already too late, right? Uh, it means that, that uh, you, you screwed up. Um, and this is very difficult because in media we don't really have the capacity to plan much ahead. Yeah, everyone who fills in donor applications knows that there's a section called the risks at the end and you fill it in and you don't really think about them and usually the planning doesn't really go much further than that. If you're in an organization that does more than that, I applaud it, but let's be honest, 80% of us don't really work much on preparing for the worst and for alternative scenarios. Um, the thing is that, you know, once, uh, and I think the challenge for us was that once, you know, the invasion had started, all of a sudden it turned out that, you know, Money doesn't solve everything because you can buy the best equipment in China, in Germany, in the UK. Um, but to ship it, you need to have a process. You need to have people on the ground. The roads are no longer passable. And, you know, 30 kilometers is like, you know, a light year. You cannot traverse this kind of distance. So if you didn't plan for this ahead, then this is extremely difficult. Um, this is not just about risk. This is also about the skill sets that you have inside your organization. Um, and I think as media, we need to pull forward and, and do a lot more uh, on that. You know, the last, um, uh, over the past month and, and, and a bit more, um, the most visible thing has been the fundraising. Uh, but I would say that this has been maybe uh, five to 10% of the work that was actually happening. 60% of the work at least was logistics. Uh, because, and this is the things that you find out, when you want to buy something in a large quantity and transport it in a large quantity, you need to consider the size of the pallets. You need to consider the weight. You need to consider what is the exact process at every single part of the journey. You need to understand how you will solve problems with all the customs officers and things like that. Because it doesn't matter that you have read all the procedures and all the regulations. When you are on the border and you have 1.2 tons of bulletproof vests and helmets, as was the case last week, and the customs doc uh, officer says, this one document that we, had never, that, that we had never heard of and we checked with the ministry, the embassy and everyone, is needed. And that person on that border is God. They make all the decisions. Or at the very least, Jesus Christ. Because the only solution that you have then is to go up the chain and to actually call God and have God call him down in the customs and tell that you need to solve this and actually move the equipment and get it out to the other side. And this is what you are doing 
five times a day on different checkpoints with different officers collecting dozens of documents along the way, and this is under the simplified situation that, uh, that we have. That's the first thing. The second thing, and it will be a bit shorter, is, um, is that uh, you need a lot of data before. So um, in between my various media uh, adventures, I spent some time in investment banking and in consulting. And I remember whenever VCs and investment banks, whatever, were making a decision to allocate millions or to make big moves, they would have hundreds of pages of industry data explaining exactly what is happening on the ground in different places and so forth. Uh, in the media world, usually we have a 15-page PDF, right? This is as, as deep as our knowledge of what is actually happening in the sector goes. Now, what was quite lucky for us, uh, and, and you know, the best advice that you can have in life is to be lucky, is that the fix had over the past two years run about a, a half a dozen, a dozen of deep industry reports and we had the budgets of all the media and we knew where they were based and we knew how much time every task took. And uh, that, that gave us a head start that was um, incomparable to anything else. Um, and then finally, I think something that we, that, that this is more towards the donor world or, or to the bigger organizations, but look, we always try to understand the big picture, but we also need to decentralize decision making. Um, this is something that is not always natural to media. If your editor tells you that this is not going this way, uh, I don't know what editors you had, but uh, for me, that was the end, right? If the editor says that we are going and doing one story, you are not doing another story. Um, but when you want to move fast and you want to deliver results, you need to take a slightly different way to managing the situation. So, and this is, by the way, something that we have seen on the battlefields in Ukraine. The Russian army is an army that is based on command and control centralized decision-making, very little autonomy on the local level. And this is one of the key reasons why the Ukrainian army, despite you know, all the challenges that, that, that it had facing the world's second most powerful army, which is organized on a project basis, on a mission control kind of uh, situation as it has been trained for many years by some of the top uh, uh, special services from around the world, the US, the UK, and so forth, was able to actively, on a local level, make decisions that impacted the fate of the war and have essentially won the battle of Kiev. Uh, well, the same thing applies to media. You need to give your people the power to make the decisions that need to be made in the moment, especially when things are moving fast. And this is also something that I think we all need to look into in terms of our culture and how we run our organizations. Um, so, okay, I was not supposed to do that. So with that being said, um, I will uh, now uh, quit the, the, the uh, ph philosophical reflections and we can move to the, um, uh, to talk a little bit about actually, you know, what was happening and what it looked like. So, um, yeah, uh, you want to Yeah, thank you, Jago, for such a perfect introduction. I would add a bit with some recent news. So thank you all again for coming to this workshop. We all know that this is a Friday evening and you're all supposed to have your glass of wine, but thank you that you're here because the war in Ukraine, this is something that is happening right now and is continuing around the clock. And Ukraine has been fighting with Russia for 44 days right now. And so it is important to talk about it every time and use any chance to spread a word about this situation. Um, today we received news uh, from our ombudsman about that there are many facts of raping women and children uh, by Russian soldiers in the suburbs of Kiev. There are many facts of direct shootings in civilians uh, by Russian soldiers. And we truly need independent journalism to document these facts and to let the world know about what is really happening. 
our journalists uh, write news sitting in a bomb shelters. They are leaving their homes and families going on the battlefields and they don't really know whether they will come back. And there are many journalists that already have been killed by Russians. So today we'll present our activities in Ukraine that help media keep going and we hope that this workshop will also help to consolidate our efforts here uh, for our journalism community to help our Ukrainian colleagues. Can we show the screen, please? Now I'm talk a little bit about what we have done and what we have achieved so far. Uh, I will go like uh, with the general information, uh, with some clarification uh, at some points. But if you all guys have an, any additional question, please feel free uh, to ask it because you see almost like uh, all the main people. Uh, who was working on all of that will be really happy to answer all of them. Yeah. Change. 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 This one? Also? Okay. This one? Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, uh, okay. but. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Ah, very good. All right. So, uh, as Jakub mentioned, the media is matter, especially during the crisis. And it was also mentioned that we've spent too many years uh, developing that market. When I started my career in Ukraine, uh, in one of the biggest media uh, holding or like uh, which has like various publishing and media outlets there was like 90 to 93 percentages which was uh, controlled of the market which was controlled by the oligarchs the people who is using the power uh, for their business interests it was a ukrainian situation and it was like not that far um, time ago like in 2012 13 and as Jakob mentioned it, after the Maidan revolution, et cetera, et cetera, the number of like five to 7% of independent media organization was growing constantly every year. And by, uh, uh, by the time of like 2021, it was like on the level of like 30%. which was a, a market share which was uh, controlled with various independent media organizations. So. Another thing that I wanted to add on Jakob's point, just a minute, uh, that it became for us, as he said, personal, not only because of a uh, like significant part of our team is from Ukraine or located in Ukraine, uh, but also we have invested to develop that part of market like uh, too much of our efforts, resources, energies, and passion. And this was, that's why personal for us to save them. And in that uh, regard, uh, we gathered all our partners, friends, uh, even friends like from not media world, like some of them like uh, from MBA alumni, from London Business School, like INSEAD, uh, another uh, volunteers, publishers across the Europe, I will tell about them a bit later on, in details, and uh, launched a campaign. On the like, first hours of the war started, and we were all, wait, uh, all went on uh, three directions. First of all, as Jakub said, we had uh, all the data in advance. So we wanted, uh, we divided our work into the three uh, directions or work streams. It's immediate support, short-term support, and long-term support, because we knew that there was some assumptions, I don't know, analysis, or you, you name it, you call it, that there might be no Ukraine anymore in a four days. We wanted to make sure whatever happens, the journalists are safe. The safety of individuals, journalists, uh, who work in Ukraine was a priority number one for us. And in that direction, we did, uh, first of all, uh, relocation support. We already had a 
um, places where we can uh, relocate them in Poland, uh, Bratislava in Slovakia, Vilnius, Lithuania, the neighboring countries with Ukraine and Eastern Europe, and also in a bit, I would say, relatively safer cities inside of the Ukraine. So that was a like really um, fast step that we uh, st uh, move that we stepped in. And secondly, uh, personal protection equipment. And this was the most challenging thing with, uh, for us. And it was not only about uh, logistics, supplies, funding, sourcing, et cetera, et cetera. But also, for example, when we were looking for those equipment, we were competing even with governments because there is a really high demand for us. Really high demand. And there was no press procedure on the uh, multinational border crossing levels, how you can uh, export and import the uh, so-called like uh, military related needs. And another thing, it's not only like um, supplying it to Ukraine, but also distributing it inside of the Ukraine. And when I say like um, distribu distribution channels inside of the Ukraine, just imagine there was 3,679 checkpoints. And most of them was organized with a bottom-up approach with the local communities who was not controlled by, the en by anyone, especially in the first days of the war. And when you're passing through that checkpoint, you see the soldiers uh, with their, like I don't know, like home guns or something like that, or Kalashnikovs, who was also provided to the territorial defense, then they don't have an equipment. And they see that the equipment is going to the journalists, and there is some attempts or questions like uh, military needed. And we were also explaining them why journalists are really important now. And we were lucky, we never had an, any issue with them, but it takes time, which is really important during the war. Every hour, every minute that you spent in each, point, each checkpoint can be uh, fatal for the journalist who is waiting you, for example, in Kharkiv or Sumer. So the, uh, the security is like really important thing. The secondly, uh, we provided like quick money transfers. For example, if somebody knows how to uh, run away from the front line battlefield, but he doesn't have a money for the fuel, gasoline, gas, uh, or to hire a car. We were making decisions like within how many, like 20 minutes for the money transfer. This was internal uh, dash, uh, in, in, uh, internal monitoring, like everything. And we, I think, spent like in the first day, like 50,000 euro, only just like for the little spendings like that. Secondly, uh, when we go to the, from individual to the media outlet level, we also uh, provided support from technical perspective to uh, protect the media organizations so cons uh, readers, their audience can get access to the information because there was a, a lot of hack attempts by the Russian trolls, the DOS attacks, and I don't know, like, uh, but uh, for example, one of our partners, uh, just showed me last week that they had 882 million paved Jews within a three weeks. Even without any DDoS attack or something like that, their website wouldn't be like able to just handle that by the infrastructure that they had before the war. So, and we had the like, uh, we were, uh, were really thankful that uh, our tech uh, partners provided the support with a backup uh, cloud migration, uh, the DOS attack protection, etc., etc., and plus uh, some microfinancial aid supports, as I said, and relocation. So it was a midterm, and we solved that. Uh, I would say relatively uh, successful. But after that, we all know that war is go ongoing. Even if war will st uh, just stop in it today, it will not bring media organizations to the state what they had before the war. There will not be like a magic advertisement market again because Ukraine already lost like it's about of like, uh, it was like 17% of their GDP uh, by the last week when I check it. Mm -hmm. And now it's growing. So uh, 
we decided to find a safe place uh, somewhere abroad, uh, Poland, Bratislava, as I said, Vilnius, so they can operate on some like short term. And we, we have provided support with housing, accommodation, uh, office space, and a lot of publishers in neighboring countries provided their own offices to share with Ukrainian colleagues. Plus, uh, we connected them to them uh, with them. Plus, we also uh, helped with legislation, uh, legalization uh, challenges that they face in the countries, and plus some uh, fundraising support. Uh, our team was working on the site with them, uh, talking to the various donors or international organizations uh, to provide uh, some. I will show the organizations that have been supported. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. One one thing that's kind of that was really important actually throughout the the um, uh, the spirit was that both the traditional donors but also publishers stepped up and yeah, okay, and uh, also publishers um, played a very big role. Uh, the first of them was sifted, I think it was in the first week or something like that, they agreed, sorry, I cannot freeze this, this is uh, automated. Um, but uh, the, um, uh, very soon after that, the local sent us money, uh, Axel Springer, uh, you know, uh, actually committed half a million uh, in uh, euros, uh, most of which have, has gone to bulletproof vests and helmets that have gone to uh, Ukrainian media. And, um, but uh, Gazeta Wyborcza, the guy, like everyone sort of came together. And look, this is actually also, I think, a very big lesson is that, yes, media needs support from lots of organizations, particularly in times of crisis, but the role that the publishers played was essential because they moved fast and a lot of the support was unrestricted. So think about the crisis in terms of the time frame. So a lot of donors came in and they were very helpful and they did a great job. But even the best-minded ones take several weeks usually to make a decision, and that's quick, you know? We had small resources, but managed to move within hours. The publishers moved within days, and then the donor community came. And that, I think, highlights the importance of the value chain. I think maybe chatbot, and then Maria, if you... Yeah, let's just show the numbers. Yeah. The achievements, this is important. Uh, 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 we are constantly updating this data. Uh, so far, we were able to raise 2.7 million dollars, uh, euros, sorry, euros, yeah. uh, and uh, as it was also 800,000 euros uh, was provided as a support in uh, fundraising efforts, uh, plus uh, relative, um, approximately half a million went for, again, uh, personal safety and security of the journalist uh, who is working in Ukraine and plus uh, we've provided so far direct financial aid to 74 regional and local media organizations with an amount of money of uh, more than 268,000 euros. And it's constantly changing, even by, uh, as we speak now here. Yeah. Also, I want could, could you? Uh, to the list, to of, the media. list of media. So uh, when we went, uh, when we got the, to the state of like uh, long term or uh, the, what is the impact of our support, we have focused our efforts to support the agenda making and market making media organizations who is operating on the ground in Ukraine. The organizations that you are seeing here, they are serving diverse range of audiences in Ukraine. Some of them is providing breaking news. Some of them is uh, working on personification of the occupiers or war crime, uh, 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 the, the soldiers of Russian army. Some of them is still watchdogging the media organizations in Ukraine. Some of them is uh, uh, working on economic part of the uh, if ec economic uh, results of the invasion, etc., etc. By the way, all you see here, they have gathered it more than one billion page views last month. Just imagine about those numbers. I never heard or I never saw that kind of numbers in Ukraine, which has like about 40 million population. There is a really high demand to the news, to the uh, to the information, and our goal was to support them so they can provide objective, fact-checked, uh, balanced uh, information to the audience that they serve. And uh, 
last thing, chatbot. I think we I, should I talk think about chatbot it. I think chatbot, and then if, if we can like go over one or two minutes. So uh, two very quick things, and I know that it's already late. So one thing that we um, we're, we're lucky enough to do is to benefit from uh, support of lots of tech companies, and this is really, you know, tech is, is, is your friend um, in, in many ways. So uh, this has been launched for the last eight days or so, um, receiving over half a thousand uh, 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 messages in the first couple of days because you have a communication problem, right? And media in particular deal with this all the time. Yeah, uh, you know, time is really <laughs> sensitive. You know, um, so uh, so um, okay, and now, but I need to move this to the other page. Um, so uh, one of the things that we were working on is, um, or that we launched, is a tool to sort of coordinate data collection. And um, okay, can I minimize this a little bit? Maybe not so much. And uh, interactions with the with the media. So yes, websites are great, landings are great, but usually when you're you know on the run and things like that, you operate via your mobile phone. Um, so this is a beta; it's still in, in process, but this is helping us live collect data and interact with lots of media. So the way it works is, you know, you you go into one of these uh, chats, um, you pick the language that you have. Uh, let's take English. I think it will be more popular. And then you can go and see and have all the resources that you need on your phone, whether it's transport in Ukraine or abroad. And it has like the links that you need for information. And every time that you're not happy with the information or you need something more, more in-depth, you can connect with the operator and they will help and guide you through this. So there is a level of centralization and of communications that can really deliver also quite a bit of impact. And I think it's media we should do more to explore these kinds of solutions. Sorry, I know I'm, I'm rushing through a little bit, uh, but um, I think, yeah, the other thing that's quite important with the fundraising thing, thank you, Jakub. So one of my main responsibilities at the FIX is fundraising for these 13 independent Ukrainian media. We offered our support uh, for them because most of them have never worked with donor community before because they mostly relied on their commercial revenues and they tried to be self-sufficient. And right now when all incomes the uh, completely dried up, there is no other option rather than go to donors or private foundations. And uh, our team is trying to be between the media and donor community because we also try to help donors to understand the Ukrainian media landscape. And we gathered kind of important data that you can see on the screen. Um, we gathered the minimal budgets of uh, every 13 of our media partners, and uh, we try to understand what are the minimal resources they need to cover their operations for half a year until the end of 2022. And we kind of assist the donor community and suggest them who they should support firstly and who needs the assistance the most. And do you know what is, yeah, please. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to say the blue lines and the, the lines, that's not an accident. We just blacked out the names of the donors and media yeah, for, you know, it's, the, uh, everyone is always sensitive about budgets, Correct. sorry. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what is interesting, but is also sad that in the first weeks of war, we uh, saw many organizations were so active and uh, we're ready to support Ukrainian media and they provided small emergency grants for operating. They also were ready to support with relocation and uh, security supplies like uh, buying helmets or uh, bulletproof vests or first aid kits, etc. And now media appears in the situation when they let their journalists go and work in the battlefields wearing a helmet but they don't have any funds to even pay them for this important work. So while we are talking to donors or private foundations, we try to pitch the idea that um, we don't see any reason that commercial uh, revenues will recover this year at the same state that they were before. And we all uh, should be ready for the situation of institutional support of all these media. Um, 
and uh, we, we really need to have a long-term uh, perspective in this. So uh, as you can see in the tab uh, that Jakub just hide, um, our minimal goal to cover six months of operations of 13 media is uh, almost 3.5 million of dollars. Uh, and uh, by this time, we already gathered 60% of that. Uh, but the end of the August is not enough. Uh, and uh, our second main goal would be to cover them till the end of the year. And we uh, literally need to have 6.6 .6 million for that. Uh, so we really hope that spreading a word even on this festival, even uh, with this tiny community here, would help us to keep our media alive because it is really important. Without independent journalism, uh, we really can't cover the truth the, and what is happening in Ukraine at all. Um, thank you so much, uh, Maria. I, I don't know if I understood correctly that you're not allowed to uh, ask questions now because of new COVID restrictions, yes. Um, but you can Twitter, uh, DM them. So I guess I should have put that up a bit earlier. Um, but I think that if anyone has any questions, then please, uh, please do that. If not, then we will be around and happy to talk. Um, just one other thing that I, that I wanted to mention, it's, it's going forward and we will probably announce uh, tomorrow, next week, uh, everything is done in a live uh, sense, is um, trying to work via a, um, to do a campaign for companies to advertise in Ukrainian media. Um, and to, you know, uh, first of all, they have a lot of views right now. Uh, so that's actually not too bad. Secondly, you know, there's uh, a, a lot of uh, talented people um, uh, that they can reach via those, those media, but also as a part of the contribution of all of those companies. Um, because, uh, and also because we don't want this to become just a donor story for the next 10 years, you know? Um, uh, the media secret s sector was vibrant. It will be vibrant again. And that brings us to the end of the presentation, I guess. Yeah, um, uh, I think uh, I just wanted to um, uh, clarify here the, 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 the money that you saw, the amount of money that we have gathered, it, mostly it was a contribution of ordinary people. It's not just donor funding. The donor funding is like minority of that. Uh, we have been able to gather like in one campaign approximately uh, 16,000 people and another one, 21,000 uh, ordinary people from Ukraine, from all over the world, and you, including, of course, Europe. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's it. Right. Okay. No messages. We can go. All right. Enjoy the Friday night. Thank you so much. Everybody.